Just a few days ago, a bridge collapsed in Norway. Now this bridge was constructed of glue laminated wood and steel, and you'll see that it should not have been a surprise, yet it still was to a lot of people. And we're gonna dive deep into the construction and how it likely failed in this video, so stick around. Okay, the bridge we're talking about today is the Tretton Bridge. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly in Norway. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce the town. Uh, this bridge was recently built in 2011 and 2012, and the bridge was touted by the engineers who designed it and the architect as a 100-year bridge. The bridge collapsed 10 years after it was completed, however. So I'm not sure how they missed that one, but we'll dig into it. I think I can possibly explain that for you. And like every good engineering disaster, of course the engineers who designed the bridge uh, have a PowerPoint presentation bragging about how brilliant their design is, which we were able to pull many photos and information from for producing this video. Now the interesting thing is, is that this bridge replaced the old bridge that was uh, there previously, that bridge actually was a 100 year plus bridge. It was built in 1894. And instead of being built out of glue laminated wood and steel, it was just built out of good old steel. Now it had several structural modifications over the years, but that was notwithstanding, it did last well over a hundred years. Okay, so let's look at the new bridge and kind of talk about how it was designed. Um, it, it is a simple single arch bridge. It is asymmetric, meaning that uh, one side is uh, sloped more than the other, if you will. There is a section referred to uh, in the drawings as a wind truss. This is the area that has bracing from one truss to the other. So the bridge has two trusses, um, if you saw that in the original photo I showed you. And then there are some bracing that brace the top of this that you would drive under if you were driving on this bridge. Now they used the old existing pillar and the old existing abutment uh, while, uh, when designing this bridge, but they did add new steel columns and a new abutment over here. And we'll kind of show those in, those pic in the pictures to orient you. But first I wanna kind of show you the aftermath of the collapse of this bridge. So here we can see the full shot of the bridge and we'll get into more detailed zoomed in shots at the, I'll call it the tail end of the bridge because of the direction the vehicles are traveling in. But over on this side, we have a single passenger vehicle. And on this side, we have what I believe is referred to as a double lorry. In America, we call them you know trucks or dump trucks. But in, in this case, it has a, a, a truck bed with material in it. It looks like crushed granite or something like that. And then it's towing another trailer just like it. So this thing weighs a lot of pounds. Here's a close-up shot of that from above, shot with a drone. You can see that the, that the lorry is full in both of its compartments there. And then you can see uh, that the water is obviously covering the bridge now because the bridge has fallen into the water. Now, the interesting thing to take away from this photo, and we'll get back to this later why it matters, is that we don't see any skid marks in front of the truck indicating to me that it really slid down. I believe the truck driver felt the bridge collapsing and like most of us probably just hit the brakes, the bridge collapsed pretty much where he was at. And then um, he probably just locked the brake so that he didn't you know, slide backwards into the water. But uh, I would say this is a real testament to the tire manufacturer that this thing didn't just slide back into the water, especially when you start seeing the angles that this thing is at. Uh, here's a photo of that single passenger car on the backside, but I wanna kind of show you, you know, just how much wood they actually used. The entire deck uh, plate was constructed of wood, glue laminated wood, and it's all bolted together. And then they pour asphalt on top of it. This is not a, this is not a, a design method I would recommend uh, if I was designing this, but I think there was a lot of motivation to use wood um, in these countries. And I won't get into that in this video. But uh, there was, a, let's just say there was a strong political and financial motivation to build a lot of bridges out of wood and really claim wood as this brilliant bridge building technology. Ironically, the old bridge, which was pure steel built in 1894, probably before that was an old crummy wooden bridge. And then they went to steel and it's almost like we're going backwards, going back to wood bridges, but we'll get into more of that. 
Here's a shot, and we're gonna be dissecting this shot a lot uh, further into the video, but this shows generally, again, where that double lorry is or that truck, and you'll hear me use lorry or truck interchangeably, I apologize, but it's just my background <laughs> and my culture. So anyway, you'll see this double lorry here, and you can kind of see where the bridge is broken apart, but we'll get into that more uh, later. Now that area that I was talking about with the wind truss, where the tops of the trusses are braced against each other, you can see that looking down the road here, and again, that traffic was moving in that direction down the road. So we actually do have a shot in the direction of that traffic. This is obviously pre-collapse, but you can see the bracing at the top for the area which they call the wind truss. And so the idea is that if some lateral winds start blowing against the bridge, that the, um, that the loads, the horizontal lateral loads will be transferred through those members and into the other truss, thus giving it more strength and stability. I think that's pretty common sense. Most of you will be able to understand that, no problem. This is one of the abutments where the, where the truss sits on top of the abutment at the end. And you can see the entire end is constructed out of steel. So that's the orange. It's kind of already rusting or corroding. You know, it's pre-weathered, they call it. The vertical members are also built out of steel. But everything else, the top cord, is built out of what they call glue lamb, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's glue laminated layers of wood. So it's just wood glued together. And the, the top cord is that way, and the bottom cord is also that way, and also the angular web members are also built out of glue lamb. And so what we're gonna get, get into further in is discussing how in the heck do those glue lambs attach to the steel. Well, here's a close-up picture of another one of the trusses, another end of the truss, sitting uh, on the uh, abutment there, the bearing. And you'll see that the wood, if you look down here at the bottom right of the picture, you'll see that the glue lamb is slotted, okay? There's like these slices in the glue lamb. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I want you to remember seeing these slots and, uh, and remember that those slots are also on top of this laminated glue lamb member. And then if you can see in the picture, and I have better pictures later on, there are lots of dots here, which indicate dowels that are driven in. So they're drilled and then driven in in order to attach the steel, uh, the steel uh, members to the glue lamb members. And then this is another shot showing a large uh, extension of steel because of course the glue lamb can't do everything. So all the important stuff that needs done in this bridge has to be done by steel because the bridge should have probably been built out of completely steel. But in any case, this is what you got. And so you have this very large steel member here uh, bearing on the actual soil abutment. The other ones I've referred to as abutments were actually just uh, bearing pads, but you can see that. And then you can also see in this picture, the new steel uh, columns that were added. And we pointed that out early on in the video. Now, getting more into the connections and sort of explaining and what we're looking at, I want you to look, this is at looking at one of the upper areas where we have the bracing right here. Um, for, I mean, they call it something else, but I'm just gonna call it the brace. And it's essentially a horizontal member that connects the tops of the two trusses to each other. And again, you can see that there are two slices in that. So presumably there would be two steel plates that are slid into that slice. Those steel plates are welded to this steel member here. Uh, and so the steel would kind of look like that. And then there would be pins that would be driven down into that. And they would be driven down in order to connect the two together. You can actually see those pin holes now a lot better here. So you can see all those dots on the left side of the picture that I just circled. And in each of those dots, they would have drilled and then driven a dowel in to connect the steel plates that are inside that wood to the, the wood itself. And so we call this a doweled connection or a double shear pin connection. There's a couple different terms we'll use, but we'll get into that more as we break that down. All right, so here's another connection. In this picture, it's really interesting because now we're getting sort of to the meat and potatoes of how this thing is built and how things are bearing on it. At the very bottom left of the picture, you can see the, the new steel column. Okay. And then on top of the steel column, you have these, these large steel cross members. Okay. And they're, they're obviously steel. And then the vertical is steel as well. 
and then everything else is wood and this here is just sort of like some sort of copper plating or something but it's basically a coping to keep weather from getting into the wood but it's really not a great protection for the wood it's going to keep some of it out but also when the wood does get wet which it will it doesn't allow it to evaporate out very effectively either so it's sort of a double-edged sword now we were talking about the the steel plates and the pin connections you can see those up at the top here you can see those pins and you can see maybe the pins over here but we'll go ahead and zoom into the top area to get a better look at that so again you have this solid steel member here okay i'll kind of hatch that in and then you have plates that come out of that now you can't see the plates because they're embedded inside the the, the glue lamb wood member but those there's multiple of those steel plates three or four or five and then of course you can see all of the pins that are driven in to connect those and again to connect the upper glue lamb a lot at the top you also have a series of pins which means that there would have been a steel plate coming in here from there as well or at least multiple steel plates coming up from this steel member which the wood would have been slotted to receive the steel goes in there and then you drive them in right so i'm driving this point home because it's really important <laughs> all right and then here's the bottom of that connection and uh, that same connection you can see that column what i did is I, I zoomed it in and i kind of enhanced the image a little bit to show you that you don't see any pins in this area and that's because the fins actually come out from this element here i'm sorry i believe the pins act the fins actually come come down from this upper area so the fins come down there's there's multiples of them and then the pins would have been out here and they would have been driven inward so we can't see them from this perspective but just know that even though you don't see the pin holes in this picture here that this glue lamb is connected to this steel member in the same way as everything else all right now this isn't a detail from this bridge but this was a similar looking detail i liked it because it saved me the time of having to draw it myself but this kind of shows you so if you can imagine that this essentially is your steel beam or member let's say down here and you can see that these i'm calling them fins or plates you can call them whatever you want but these are the uh the plates that come out and then essentially you would take your piece of lumber material which maybe your lumber material comes and meets this thing like this right and that's your that's sort of your cross-sectional area of the lumber that comes in and sits there so in order to make that work you would you would have slotted your lumber for each of these and you would have cut them in so that when you fit the like like lego pieces when you fit them together then all you have to do is drill out here and connect your dowels through and those dowels would go all the way through my angles are a little off so i apologize now the picture on the right shows that completed assembly essentially but it shows it without the wood so that it's easier to see but these these dowels would not normally be driven and not, well not normally they could not be driven until the wood is already in place and sitting over these fins or plates if you will so that's these details again aren't exact for this bridge but that kind of gives you an idea of how the bridge is built all right so in trying to figure out these connections because you know i've used a lot of glue lamb before and one of the places that i absolutely would never use glue lamb is exposed to weather and i most certainly would not use it on a bridge exposed to water spray freeze thaw temperatures and all these other types of elements and so i thought it was really fascinating that they thought they could get away with this and i say this with all seriousness because this is the third bridge now that's fallen in this area of the world that's built in the exact same way and we're, we'll get into a little bit more of that later but it seems to be a sort of a recurring theme of how it failed so what i did was i started digging into research papers on glue lamb construction specifically glue lamb uh, uh, shear connections and tension connections so i found lots of reports and studies lots of research lots of people smarter than me have studied this stuff and tested these materials so here even though the i will say one thing you'll see pictures of these materials and they won't look like glue laminated wood but the idea is that glue lamb is essentially layers of wood glued together so with proper setup in your lab you can test individual specimens of wood and then you can sort of translate those findings into glue laminated assemblies 
So in this picture that you're looking at here, this was from a, a research paper that was uh, delivered to the World Conference on Timber Engineering in 2014. And it may be a little difficult to see, but essentially it was a bolted connection uh, working in shear, and, which means the bolts were working in shear, right? And so then you had basically a steel plate which was pulling this way and the wood was being pulled this way which creates this tension. So there's a, there's a tension in the wood and the testers wanted to test this until the wood broke. Now, if you see this vertical line here, this is not a break. That's just some marker or ink or something that they left on the wood. So, so don't get distracted by that. What they were hoping to do was find that the wood would break like this. But what they ultimately found was that the wood almost always failed by splitting the wood along this area here. So I kind of drew in the wood splits, but they are in the picture. You can see them much more obviously down in the lower pictures, but you can see that the wood is split. So you have to think of these bolts as like an ax head or a wedge. And, and the it, they're in the way of the fibers of the, of the wood. In other words, they're in between the fibers of the wood. So in other words, when you start pulling the wood in tension, these bolts are gonna act like wedges and they're gonna wanna push and split the wood apart, which is exactly what the, the, um, the researchers found. And no matter what bolt pattern, that's what you're seeing here, uh, joint configuration A, joint configuration B, and joint configuration C, no matter what joint pattern they picked, it always split down the outer face edge of, of the bolt uh, assemblage, okay? So then in 2018, uh, in the Journal of Wood Science, different researchers published a paper testing a very similar concept. Here, they actually put the steel plate between two layers of glue laminated wood. Uh, you can see the steel, it's very dark, but it doesn't show up in the picture very well because they didn't take it a, a very big picture of it. But there's a steel plate in there. And essentially that steel plate was pulled this way and then the wood was pulled that way, creating tension. And you can see how if you look at the, the uh, really close to the bolts themselves, the bolt locations, you can see that they actually wallowed out the wood, if you will, and you can see where the wood hole used to be where it stretched it. Over here on the right picture, they went ahead and removed the bolts where they found deformation of the bolts themselves, so the bolts bent, but also you can see these holes are no longer circular holes, they are like long ovals, if you will, right? So it stretches the wood. And then of course, just like in the study from 2014, they found that the primary mode of failure was not breaking across the wood, which we would all love because that would be the strongest way uh, of keeping this thing from failing, but it would actually fail by splitting the wood right at the outer fibers of the, of the pattern of the bolts. And so again, they tested this in 2021. So this is not like, and I'm trying to drive this home because this is not like um, something I'm just making up, right? You'll see why this matters when we start looking at why Trenton Bridge collapsed a few days ago. All right, so here again, you they found that the bolts deformed. They, they, they have nice little colors showing you where the maximum loads and deflections were. And again, the primary mode of failure in a what they call a perfect joint was splitting of the wood. All right, so nothing new there. And again, here's another test. Similar, different materials, but the idea is, hey, I got two pieces of wood. Let me stick a piece of metal in there. Let's bolt it all up in, in a, a double shear fashion and let's pull on it. So in this case, they would have pulled the wood down and they would have pulled the steel up to create tension in the joint. And of course it fails by splitting. Now in their report, and I thought this was interesting, I, I just wanted to read this section to you. And they said, from the beginning of the loading, the embedment in timber holes increased to the point where the tested specimens were broken by tension perpendicular to the grain. So perpendicular to the grain would be this way. So what they're saying is that they, from the beginning of, the, it's a weird way that they're saying it. I, and it's sometimes I think things get lost in translation because they're not, I don't think they're native English speakers who wrote this, this research paper. But they said uh, from the beginning of the loading, the embedment in timber holes increased to the point where the tested specimens were broken by tension perpendicular to the grain. I think what they were trying to say is that they wanted to break it perpendicular to the grain. That was the intent of the, of the design of the test. And if you notice the distance from this bolt here to the lumber is much shorter from then. And I know there's some optics going on here and stuff like that. But to me, it appears to be much shorter than the distance from the bolt to the end of the wood there. So they go on to say the failure of, of most specimens occurred by splitting the timber element under the bolt when the tensile strength perpendicular to the grain was exceeded 
and when the cross links between the fibers were broken. So they're talking about the fiber connections between that, that gap between those fibers when that joint was broken. Wood intention, unlike in compression, shows little plasticity and is broken by brittle fracture. So what they're saying is, is they load and load and load. There's very little warning signs and then boom, it just breaks apart. You lose all capacity and the thing's gone. That's not like boating well. I will say what's interesting, all these papers that I've been quoting so far, the conclusion was, um, this is great news. Like wood is really good. We should use it more often in construction. Look at how good the joints held up. Because again, when you test things in a lab, you're always gonna test it to failure and you're gonna check the mode of failure. But what they were really excited about was how much load it took to create those failures. So they said, this is a great construction material. However, and you'll see this later on in this, in this video, this is something where there's a disconnect between reality like how it performs in the field with a river running under it and rain and freeze and thaw versus doing this in an air conditioned warehouse, this type of test. In 2021, again, another paper submitted to the World Conference on Timber Engineering. Uh, they concluded after now, now we've had a couple bridges collapse and we've had a, a sports arena collapse in Denmark, all built out of glue lamb. And, and the main failures were the connections, these connections that I've been showing you. And in this, in this research paper, I'm going to quote them. They say, major examples of structures collapse led by brittle failure in doweled slotted in plate connections. So that's what we're talking about, that, that connection design. Doweled slotted in plate is sort of like the way they're phrasing it, but it's, it's the plates being slotted into the, into the wood. Are the two trusses, so anyway, so they're saying examples of collapse are the two trusses of the Siemens Sports Arena in Denmark and the truss of the Perkelo Bridge in Norway. Okay, now here's where it gets funny. Uh, sad, but funny. Uncertainty in the evaluation of connections deformability is responsible for local damage in connections and change of force transfer mechanisms compare to those considered in the design. So let's stop here. I will read the rest, but what they're basically saying is uncertainty in the evaluation of connections deformability is responsible for local damage and connections. So what they're saying is that the connection didn't perform the way we designed it to perform. It didn't, you know, these bridges, the, 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 the Perkelo Bridge in Norway, the Siemens Sports Arena in Denmark, our, our software says they shouldn't have failed, yet they did. We don't understand why these connections didn't perform correctly. And so they go on to say, use of stiffness model of individual connector along with procedures available in the codes lead to an overestimation of the effective stiffness. And again, we're talking about the connection between steel and glue lamb lumber connections. So there is, an, there is an overestimation of the effective stiffness. Okay. So that's sort of background science that we need to know about these connections. Um, the, in a lab, they test out well. In computer software, they test out fine. But nobody's actually tested these things in a real world application. And when they have, these buildings in, in, in Norway and in Sweden and Denmark, they're collapsing, right? They're collapsing after only five years, 12 years, seven years, so on and so forth. All right, so here's some pictures of the bridge being built. Sections of the trusses were built off-site, okay, in a warehouse, and then they were delivered to the site and lifted into crane. So, the, so all of this doweling and drilling and stuff did not happen in the field. Some did, but not all of it. But this is a, this is a picture of a, um, a section that's already been joined. So there was some sort of joint somewhere in here. So the truss has already been joined at least once. This is probably three sections, I would guess of this one truss that we're looking at here on the left. Uh, but you can see that it has not been connected to the next end. So if we zoom in on that, we can see those plates now. It's, it's a little hard. I tried to enhance the image as much as I possibly could, but we can see that there are these steel plates and there are steel plates down here. And so then in order to connect the next truss, it would come and it would have timber components it would have a top cord and it would have a bottom cord. And again, like Lego pieces, these would slide into each other and then in the field be bolted together. I point this out only to point out that while some of these members are continuous, some of the glue, many of the glue lambs have to have joints. You can't just make a glue lamb that's 300 feet long or 500 feet long or however long they needed for the bridge. You've got to make it in sections. So you're going to have these break points. And if you look real close on the far left of the picture, you can actually see a vertical line in the top cord of the far truss 
where you can see where that joins together. And then when this piece comes in and gets built into this side, you'll see a cold joint as well there. So I'm gonna call those CG or CJ and CJ for the cold joints or construction joints, if you will. All right, and then going back to that original picture I showed you at the top, now hopefully with everything we've been looking at, this makes sense where I'm talking about the slotted connections here and we've got the dowels coming in from the top and we've got the, the, we've got the dowels coming in on this side, which means that there must be steel plates over here. All right, so I'm drawing quickly, so I'm not the best when I draw quick. All right, now let's get back to the image I said we were gonna look at and analyze in depth. Okay, a couple things I wanted to do is I wanted to really understand, you know, do we, do we think this truck moved drastically from where it is from when the bridge collapsed? I would argue that I don't think it has. Again, looking at the top, I don't see any drag marks where the thing was, you know, hit slammed on its brakes and was drugged down the, the, the back of the hill. I think it stayed relatively put. I mean, it might've moved a, a foot or two, maybe a meter or so, but I don't think it moved that much during this collapse. I think it roughly stayed put and he locked in the parking brake. You can actually see that he sort of turned the front wheel, he or she, whoever was driving that, turned the front wheel so as to prevent this uh, vehicle from easily sliding down uh, uh, this, this slope. So I think the truck is pretty much where it is, was at when the bridge broke. Now, going back and looking at the bridge, I wanted to kind of refresh your mind about this profile of the bridge and where we're at. And the, where the collapse, where that last picture is right here, and this picture is right here, is generally in this vicinity of the bridge. It's right around that steel column. If you go back and look, you can see the steel columns right here. These were the new pylon supports for the bridge that were installed when this bridge was built in 2011, 2012. Okay. So if we zoom in on those uh, new columns, they even labeled it new columns, I kind of pictorially quickly drew in where that truck rests on the deck, on the road surface, and where that lines up with all of the truss members. Now the truss joints that I'm, I'm, in, I'm interested in, I, I labeled the truss joints at the bottom as A, B, C, and D. So the A, B, C, and D are the labels for the joints themselves. And I'm gonna show you where those joints are at in the picture, but I think I really, pretty accurately, again, within maybe a meter, located this truck according to this drawing, this design drawing. And I did so using a couple methods. And one of the methods is I went over and I looked at this construction drawing and I looked at members that we knew where they would line up. If you go back and look, you'll notice that this vertical member here of the truss lines up perfectly with the new columns. That vertical member is this member right here. So we know that point C and point C are consistent with each other, okay? Now, from point C to figure out where the truck is, we want to sort of trace, uh, you know, where from point C to point A, but point A is under the water. However, in this distance, the distance from point A to point C is very close because the slope is very subtle with the top chord. It's very close to this distance. They're approximate of each other, that distance there. And we can see this joint here, and we can see this joint here in the picture. So I measured from that joint over to this joint, okay? And I drew a blue line and then I moved that blue line without stretching it or modifying it over to where it would end up in the water. And you can see it, it's right basically at the end there. And then I copied that line and I put it up at the hinge point of the deck itself to find where the lorry was. And you can see it lines up pretty much with the front of the rear cart, okay? Now, that's, that's just sort of, that's orienting ourselves for geometry. This proves nothing. This is just locating everything and locating where each of the joints are. So again, joint A is underwater. Joint B is right here. Joint C is shifted. It's obviously not, it's, it's, it used to be up here when the bridge was, was standing, but now it has obviously moved down. Uh, and then bridge, joint D has actually fallen onto the ground. So what we're missing between C and D is we're missing this entire top cord member here. You can see there's a piece of it. There's like a shrapnel piece of it, but we're missing that top piece. And we'll get into that a little bit as we analyze these photos a little deeper. So let's look specifically at the joint above A. 
One of the things I want to point out, like we talked about earlier, is you have these construction joints and you have a construction joint here. What this tells us is that the glue lamb member is discontinuous through here. So the fibers, the wood fibers, if you will, can't transfer load. So all the load has to be transferred through the plates, through the pins, into the steel, which means that we have a point of maximum stress on the wood, as opposed to um, this joint, for example, where the wood is continuous through the steel joint or across the steel joint. We would not have as much stress in the wood as we do at this location that I have here in color. And you can see, uh, like kind of like how we mentioned before, that one of the failure modes of glue lamb is that it splits apart. So moving on, looking up at the joint above C, okay, we can see a couple interesting things. One, we see the uh, remnants of the top couple plies here. We can also see that there's a gap here, okay? And what this shows me is that there was a large bending stress. Like think of it as, as, as if you're holding a handful of like dry spaghetti noodles and you're about to break them and you're bending them. That's kind of what this looks like to me. And so this tells me that we have this large sort of bending that's going on. And bending is not something I would expect to happen to cause the collapse. So I think this happened as a result of the collapse. So in my opinion, I'm sort of eliminating uh, uh, node C as a point of primary failure uh, because it is, the, it is the thing that after everything else failed, it had to bend to break, uh, if you will. And then looking at the last thing here, uh, zoomed in on the same photo, is I want you to look at the missing cross-section member at the lorry. It's laying down right here. Okay, but you can see, and I told you about the, the shear failure and, the, and, the, and the, the way that this glue lamb is gonna fail. You can see there's a plug of wood still left in between the wood, in between the steel plates, but it basically just ripped the rest of the glue lamb out. Now this member, this cross member, which should have been uh, going from here to here, okay, that's where it should have been. This is a tension member most of the time. Most of the day, it's a tension member. Where this lorry is located on the bridge, this member would have been in tension. Um, and the fact that it's literally like the only, out of all the pictures you go through, it's literally like the only um, cross member that's missing, that tells me that this thing experienced a lot of tensile stress, right, either right at failure or um, right, uh, uh, right after failure. So during or right after failure. Let's talk about uh, what I believe is the actual um, initiating cause of this collapse. I didn't have time to just put it together because there's just so much information I found out, but the other two glue lamb bridges that have collapsed have both collapsed while a heavy truck was on the bridge. So in other words, a big massive point load was on the bridge moving, you know, moving, but it's still a, at any given point, it's a point load. And it always, and they broke there. And the, and the reason why they broke was due to the connection failure. So what I wanted to show you was going back to this diagram, we kind of looked at the previous, and I'll go back to the previous picture, um, identifying A, B, C, and D, right? But what I wanted to show you here is that the load from this, uh, this compartment here, if you will, or this, this piece of the, of the lorry truck bed, and the load from here would have been immense, very high. Now the bridge is supposed to be designed to carry these types of loads from what I understand. However, the bridge was designed using 3D modeling software, and it was designed using wood properties that are gained from these various types of research papers and studies that people do. And what, they, what the entire design seems to lack is any attention to detail or care about how this thing's actually gonna perform in the real world. How does the glue hold up over time? Why would you, why would you, make your member like this and lay up all your lamination layers in this fashion and then put your dowels right into those joints all you're doing is just promoting splitting it, it, it's 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 a, it's very strange but when you model this in software the software doesn't really take into consideration the laminations and the glue and everything else what you're doing is you're feeding into the software simple material properties so the software sees the, the material as basically being homogenous when you put this in. Now you can model it for the different layers and all this other stuff, but for the most part, most of the software that bridge designers and engineers are using 
they would have put that member in as a full size and they would have into the software and they would have given it homogenous uniform building material quality. So they would have given it a modulus of elasticity and they would have given it, uh, you know, it's, it's stress and strain uh, curves and all that stuff. All right, so let's get back to the lorry and the loads though. So you have these two massive loads here. Now in a truss bridge, especially a truss bridge of this design, when you have loads like this, this load here, let's look at load, uh, we'll call this, you know, alpha, and we'll call this one beta. If you look at the first load on the back of the truck, this would have created a massive, massive tensile load on the lower members. Okay, let me actually move this out. All right, so it would have created a massive tensile load. That tensile load looks like that, right? It's a, it's a, it's a stretching of things, and it would have created a large compressive load. Now, the glue lamb and the connections are arguably fine in compression. It's the tension that we're worried about. But what's really interesting about this truck and where it was and where it was loaded is that we have two really large loads. And these two really large, lo large loads would have created a massive tension here in this member, and it would have created a massive tension here in this member. And these tensions are somewhat like cumulative. So at junction A, you would have had an incredibly high uh, uh, tensile load on that connection. And I think given, given the fact that, that the, the connection was poorly detailed and that the fact that the connection was um, 10 years old, it's glue laminated, it's exposed to weather, it's exposed to corrosion of the pins. If you've been following this channel, you've got to ask the question by this point in this video, you're telling me, Josh, that there was nothing protecting those pins from rusting out? What about the steel? All the steel, steel was completely exposed. I mean, what prevents water from getting into this lumber and completely rotting everything out, uh, the lumber and everything? Well, the lumber's treated. Okay, well, if you've ever worked with treated lumber, you'll know that there's no way treated glue lamb is gonna last 100 years, okay? And you can't treat glue lambs necessarily as well as you treat other types of wood materials because it could break down and mess with the glue. So it's a very, very strange situation to me. And I think to me, the, 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 the uh, uh, tensile failure at node A is the reason why this bridge came down. But of course, you know, I'm open to having my opinion changed and feel free to put anything in the comments that you think I might be wrong on. And um, we'll find out as, uh, as time goes on and what they report is the actual failure. But They've got, you got to remember, they've got a lot riding on the success of glue lamb bridges for some reason in the Norwegian countries. So we'll, we'll have to take anything they say, obviously, with a grain of salt. This video was, of course, sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and app that utilizes interactive hands-on learning to sharpen your mind and learn new STEM skills. Uh, these are lessons in science, technology, engineering, and math that will enhance your current understanding of how the world works but also teach you new skills you can actually use. I have personally been using the Brilliant app on my phone because the app is simple to use, it has a clean interface, and the lessons are broken down into bite-sized nuggets that I can usually complete in five or 10 minutes. Since I've started using the app, I have learned so much. Like I thought I knew a lot, but apparently I, there's still more to learn, and I love learning something new every day. In this video, we looked at the recent collapse of a bridge in Norway. In Brilliant Scientific Thinking course, you will use the same structure types and learn concepts of stability and structural design. Besides the mobility of the app and the obvious efforts that went into designing it, I really like the fact that you can gift a subscription to someone else. If you have a child or other family member that loves to learn and is always telling you about new things they discovered, get them a subscription and watch their minds grow. My family loves it. Viewers of this channel can sign up now at brilliant.org forward slash building integrity and the first 200 of you will get 20% off of your annual subscriptions. I want to thank Brilliant for sponsoring this video and you all for supporting this channel.